Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Evening, friends. I'm a very grateful recovered alcoholic. My name is Jerry. It's uh, nice to be standing behind one of these with a suit on and not having to enter in a plea. <laughs> I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me out here. Um, about three months ago, Sandra called me and asked if I was uh, willing to come out and speak. And, and my first inclination was to say no, because I always want to say no. Because who really wants to travel across Canada to share in front of the most selfish, self-centered, judgmental people in the entire world? <laughs> Yeah, they need a lot of vodka, a lot of God. And today I brought God with me. You know, in that moment of silence, they asked Lois Wilson what she used to do during the moment of silence. She said, I invite God into the rooms. And that's what I've learned to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I believe, I don't, it's not that I don't believe that God isn't here because God is here. And I believe this is a celebration where we really come to see the power of God working in people's lives. But I believe God's a gentleman and he doesn't go where he isn't welcome. And he doesn't stay where he, where he doesn't want to be anymore. So I believe that, you know, um, I've invited God to demonstrate through me what he can do. So if you don't like this talk, you know who to blame. (laughs) You know, by the power and grace of a loving God, who I gained access through you people, the fellowship, good sponsorship, and the clear-cut instructions given in the recovery portion of this book, Alcoholics Anonymous, I've not had a drink since June 2nd, 2008, and for that I'm eternally grateful. So I may be the youngest speaker that you've ever had here, but, you know, my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is second to none. You know, I have a God that is absolutely madly crazy in love with me, and I have no idea why. Because I didn't do anything for it, and that's what God's grace is. It's this unearned, undeserved gift. If I got what I deserved, you would have another speaker in front of you here tonight. Because I'd probably be locked up for the rest of my life or dead. And Alcoholics Anonymous gave me a way out. I came in via a treatment center um, through recovery. And uh, Alcoholics Anonymous did not get me sober. I came to my first meeting and I was six days sober. And, and you know, when they talk about how we share in Alcoholics Anonymous, and sometimes you hear in, in how it works, it says our, our stories, uh, what it was like, what happened, and what we're like now. And that's a really great way to, to do this. And it says our tales uh, before and afterwards, and that's a great way. And the best instruction I ever found, found on how to share in Alcoholics Anonymous was on page 29 of the big book. And it said each individual in their personal story describes in his own language from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. And that must be what my job here is in Alcoholics Anonymous, to talk about how I built this relationship with a power greater than myself. Because without that, I would, I would have nothing. And, and I came in to Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, I loved it when I first got here. People were laughing and jingling change in their pocket, and some of you look like you're getting laid on a regular basis, and, <laughs> and that was real appealing stuff to me. Well, when you come out from an alley, it's only up, it's, everything looks good from there. You know, it's not that I didn't want a girlfriend, it's a little, just a little hard when you're homeless. It's not much of a dating scene out there. And I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and, I, and I, you know, my last drunk was June 2nd, 2008, and I was in an alley in the downtown east side of Vancouver. And uh, I was having a beer with uh, a friend of mine, or an acquaintance of mine. And I looked across the alley that, uh, that I was sitting in. There was some guy picking around the garbage and wobbling. And he was, looked like he was all messed up. And I said, if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up like that guy. And a moment of clarity hit me. And I said, wait a minute. You're in the same alley. <laughs> You're doing the same thing. You already are that guy. And I gave my last seven beer away. And I walked down the street in a bright, sunny afternoon. And I had no idea what I was about to do. And I started walking down uh, one of our streets, Cordova Street, and I walked by this place called the Union Gospel Mission. And there was a bunch of people lined up inside, on the side, and they were going into the building, and I guess they were going to get something to eat. And one of the staff members, as I was walking by, he said, are you hungry? And I thought, wow, I can't even remember the last time I ate. I said, yes, I am hungry. And he says, well, come on in and have some food. And I thought, how great is this? And they brought me into a chapel. And I went, oh, I've just been duped. You know, I don't want to be in a chapel. I don't need you preaching at me. And in this chapel... During the service before we got our food, they had mentioned that they had a a hostel there. 
And I was staying at one that was called uh, Crackheads or Curfews. Crackheads with Curfews was what we called this place. And I thought maybe if I stay, stay at this other place, I can, I can dry out for a couple of days and, and go back to work and, and feel better. And, and so I, I decided to stay at this hostel for the night. And I began the process of detoxing on a chapel floor. And during that night, they went around and they did a nightly devotion. And during this devotion, they had mentioned that they had a treatment center there. And I'd never heard of treatment center. I'd never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous or any of the other fellowships out there. And, and the next morning I woke up or came to, and uh, I looked at the guy and I said, what's this deal about a treatment center you have here? And this guy turned around and he ran from me. And I thought, wow, they're really helpful here. <laughs> and he comes back about a minute later with an application form. And I said, no, 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 no. I'm not one of them. Can't you tell I have a job? I've got, I've got clean clothes on and, you know, I'm not one of them. And he said, well, just look it over. And so I, so I took it and I put it in my pocket and I walked across the street to the place called uh, The Gathering Place. And, and it's where you go and have coffee and donuts. And, and I went in there and I pulled out this form and I started to try to read it. And words started jumping around on the page. And I crumpled it up into a ball and I threw it in my backpack. And I had my half a cup of coffee because I had the shakes so bad. And during that thing there, one of the staff members came up to me and said, can you do us a favor? And I thought, well, sure, I can do you a favor. And they said, when everybody leaves here, can you stay behind and help us clean up? And I said, absolutely, that won't be a problem. And now we're wet by, and then they started filing people out, and the guy came up. And I, I walked up to the guy, and he said, where's the broom? And he said, let's not worry about that broom. Let's see that little piece of paper you had. And I thought, I've just been duped again. <laughs> And he started asking me some questions about drugs and alcohol. And I said, I don't have a problem. I have a full-time job. I'm just, I'm just in between places right now. And, you know, I've been in between places for about a year and a half. <laughs> and uh, within about 15 minutes, I'm talking to a counselor. And this counselor's asking me all these questions, and I can't answer them. You know, he says things to me like, do you ever drink alone? And I said, well, when I'm buying, yes. When you're buying, no. Um, <laughs> And he asked me all these other questions that really had nothing to do with alcoholism. But what he did is he said, can you stay sober for three days? Because you have to have 72 hours before you come into this treatment center. And I said, sure, no problem. And in hindsight, it had been over 15 years since I put three days of sobriety together. And I began the process of detox. And I, and I went through convulsions. And I was, I was psychotic. And I don't use that term loosely. I mean, I was seeing shadows and hearing voices. And, and it was a very rough detox. And on the, on the third day, I got admitted to this treatment center, and I went in, and they said, well, here was a 12-step program, so you do the steps here. And they gave me a big book, and they gave me a questionnaire, about 200 questions on powerlessness of alcohol. And I took it, and, and you know, I spent a couple days around the treatment center, and they took me to my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And like I said, I immediately fell in love with the fellowship when I got here. I thought people were just fantastic in Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember walking into a, a, a room, and it reminded me of a line in the big book. It says, we're people who would not normally mix. And I remember walking into the Alano Club in downtown Vancouver and seeing this old lady, little old lady with gray hair, this East Indian fellow with a turban and another guy with a mohawk and all kinds of metal and stuff in his nose, and they're standing there having a coffee together laughing. And I thought, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> we are a people who would normally not mix. There's probably none of you in here that would drink with me. I would drink with you if you're buying and driving. I would make an exception for that. <laughs> and in this treatment center, I, I, I decided to to say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this thing then. And, and I started to read the big book. And, and if you've never read the big book before, for the first time, it kind of reads like hieroglyphics. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I'm going through and I'm answering all the questions and I'm taking it like a school test because I was very academic and I did very well in school and I'm well read. And I'm answering the questions. And I finish the step one and I go and I hand it to him and he leaves through it in about 30 seconds and goes, here's step one B, another 75 questions. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so during this time, I'm going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got nothing better to do, so I'm doing two, three, four. Um, in Vancouver, we had the privilege where you can do up to six meetings in a day. And I've done that on a number of occasions in my early sobriety. And, and uh, I'm about 30 days sober, and things are getting worse. I'm not feeling like other people are feeling when they stop drinking. I'm, not, I'm, I'm full of fear. I'm full of anger. I have anxiety. I'm, I'm 
so wound up about this whole deal. And, and what happened was, is I, I quickly fell out of love with the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at about 43 days sober from this treatment center, well, before that, I'd done what every good alcoholic does when they first get sober. I did my back taxes. So I got about a $4,000 check from, from Revenue Canada. And I'm in a treatment center. And I want to drink. And I tell my roommate, I start packing my stuff. He said, what are you doing? I said, I hate sobriety. I hate the way I feel. I'm going to go get drunk. And he begged me. He said, please, just stay for one more day. Just stay one more day and something will happen. Something will change. And I said, okay, I'll stay for one more day. And I ended up going to a meeting that night. And as I was leaving this meeting, this white van pulled up beside me and it had hope written on the side of it. And I'd seen it at the treatment center. It was part of a mobile mission that they, they, they did. And the guy opened the door and he said, get in. And I jumped in the van with him and he looked at me and he said, are you done? And I looked back at him and I lied. I said, yeah, I'm done. And he never said another word to me. He drove me back to that treatment center. And the next morning I woke up and I started to pack my things. And my roommate said, please don't do this. Just stay one more day. He says, tell you what, if nothing happens, I'll even go out with you. And I said, okay, I got you then. I'll stay for one more night. I'll stay for one more day. I'll try this thing one more time. And I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. And as I was leaving that meeting, this white van pulled up again. And it had hope written on the side of it. And the guy said, get in the van. <laughs> and I jumped in the van. He looked at me and he said, are you done? And I said, what is this, Groundhog Day? Did we do this yesterday? <laughs> And he said, tell me what's been going on for you. And I said, well, I've been to about 100 meetings in the last 45 days. I've done this treatment center, steps one, two, three. And I feel like drinking. I'm so angry. I'm so just out of it that I, I, I can't cope with the way I feel. And I know alcohol works. And he says, and I, and I told him, I said, I've met a lot of really cool people here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, it was fun for what it lasted for the first 30 days but I'm done. And he looked at me and he said, sounds to me like you don't need to meet any more people. Sounds to me like you need to meet God. And if you want, I can show you how to do that. And for no better reason than shutting this guy up, I said, sure, okay. And he looked at me and he said, I'm your sponsor, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and I said, what's your name? And he said, my name's Arnold Molesta and I'm a recovered alcoholic. And on Monday afternoon, I'll see you with your big book in the classroom upstairs. And I had a little bit of hope because somebody had reached out, because I'd spent all these times in meetings and I'd seen all the clicks that were happening in meetings and I couldn't be part of that. See, today I create that, I create the fellowship that I crave. And, I, and, and if, you, if you wanna make a friend in Alcoholics Anonymous, take them through the steps. And that's what I've learned to do. And we got into this room, about seven of us, seven of us guys, and, and he, he told his story and I could identify with a bunch of it, you know, especially the drinking parts of it. The scenery was all different, but I could re I, I, this guy was, spoke about his feelings with such dignity that, I, that I, I fell in love with him. And he went around the room and he asked everybody, he said, why are you here? And the first guy said, I'm here for my job. My work sent me here. He said, okay, good, good. And he went to the next person. He said, why are you here? And he said, oh, for my family. My wife is going to leave me if I don't get sober. And he said, okay, fair enough. And he came to me. He said, Jerry, why are you here? And I looked at him. I said, I want to learn to live sober. And he said, I like that. And he walked up to a whiteboard and he wrote, learn to live sober on the whiteboard. Then he erased learn too. And all it said was live sober. And he said, how about we do this together? And he started taking me through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he started to read the big book and explain what it meant and had experiences with it. And I remember he's reading the big book and I'm looking down at mine. I'm looking up at his and down at mine. I'm thinking, holy crap, this guy's got the teacher's edition. Because it was making sense. And it made no sense to me before. But what he had was an experience with it that he was sharing. And I finally learned what it was to be alcoholic. Because for the last 45 days, I've been going to meetings and introducing myself as an alcoholic. Because, well, I didn't want to be the only person in the place that wasn't. I knew my butt was on fire because of alcohol, but I didn't know the exact symptoms. And he explained to me the first part of it. He qualified me. He said, do you ever drink more than you intend to drink? And I said, all the time. All the time. You know, I, I, I say things like, I'm just going to go to the pub with my, with my work buddies and have a couple. And I would leave at 1 o'clock. Well, that's because when they kick you out, the lights came on. And he explained to me, he said, this is called the physical phenomenon of craving. And it only happens in an alcoholic. Non-alcoholics don't feel this. And all that says is that once I ingest alcohol into my system, my body says, I want more. 
and I don't, and I can't control the amount I take. And I, and I went, wow, I've been doing this for years. For years I've been trying to regulate my drinking and, and control it. And now I understand that I have this disease and it's nothing morally that I've done wrong. It's not that I'm not smart enough. It's simple fact that my body reacts differently to alcohol. See, I remember my first wife. Wow, there's a lot of information in that sentence. Um, <laughs> she used to say crazy things when we were drinking. She used to say things like, I'm too drunk. And I'm like, well, you can't be. If you can say it, it's obviously not true. <laughs> but you see, her reaction to alcohol was much different than mine. She started to feel like she was losing control when she started to drink. And she would be on her second glass of wine, and she'd push it across the table, and I'd say, well, what, is there something wrong with it? I'll call the waiter over. She says, no, 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 no. I'm starting to feel it. And I said, so am I. Because <laughs> if you're not going to drink that, then I am. <laughs> I just want you to be clear on that. She says, no, no. You know, she was a normal drinker. Um, God forgive her. She seems to have been born that way. And if drinking was the only problem that we had, in, uh, if drinking alcohol was the only problem we had in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's a simple solution to that. Nancy Reagan's Just Say No campaign in the 80s would have worked for us. What do you mean? I could have said no? Nobody told me that. See, I'd said no many times and succumbed to the drink again over and over and over and over and over and over. Because the real problem centers in my mind. And that's the part that really started to make sense to, about alcoholics and on to me. And he says, you suffer from an obsession. He asked me, he said, do you ever have a really, really good reason not to drink and found yourself drunk? And I said, all the time. For my kids' birthdays, for Christmases, for anniversaries. I would always be, you know, I would go to a wedding and there'd be two other alcoholics there. And guess who I'd socialize with? The two other alcoholics. And I'd never meet another person in the place because I'm a drinker. And when I start to drink, the phenomenon of craving kicks in, and I drink with a sense of urgency, like I'm about to arrive at the next drink, like, ta-da, here I am, and everything's all perfect, and I've just reached this perfect drunk, and what always happens is I overshoot the mark, you know? I like the effect produced by alcohol, that's why I drink. And maybe some of you can relate to some of the reasons why, why I drank. You give me two tequilas, and all of a sudden I get taller. Anybody get taller when they drink? You give me four tequilas, and I'm funny. You know, I, I crack me up. You give me, you give me six tequilas, and I'm an expert on many subjects. I become brilliant. You give me eight tequilas, and I love everybody. And the best thing that happened most of all was that feeling that I had when I first got there, that these people I was around, that I wasn't good enough, smart enough, tall enough, good-looking enough. You give me ten tequilas, and all of a sudden I start thinking, you guys are pretty lucky to have me here. <laughs> and what I've just described to you is called an entire psychic change. And Dr. Silkworth recommends having one without booze. See, because what I really suffer from is a spiritual malady. And it's something that's not discussed in the rooms of alcoholics quite enough. You know, if, if just not drinking and going to meetings would work, all of us would have been sober a long time ago. I can tell you that not drinking and going to meetings will work right up until the time you drink again, if you're alcoholic. If you're not alcoholic, you can do anything you want. I don't even know why you'd want to be here. I know if I was an alcoholic, it's certainly where I wouldn't want to spend my Saturday night. You know, if you told me four years ago that you'd be traveling across Canada to speak to a group of people about finding a power greater than yourself, I'd have said you're crazy. And what happened was, is through the, through the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I met this power. You know, when I realized why I needed a spiritual experience, because what I suffer from is spiritually. See, when I'm not drinking is the problem. I suffer from alcoholism. The disease begins when the bottle ends, and it's after I'm drinking is how I feel, and when I'm not drinking, I'm restless, I'm irritable, and I'm discontent. And the number one symptom of untreated alcoholism is depression. And sometimes the depression would be so low-lying that it almost felt like boredom. But these are the things. And there's only two things in the world that'll fix that. One is a fifth of Jack Daniels, or two is spiritual experience. And that was the whole idea about what the second step was to me. And when my sponsor started taking me through the chapter, we agnostics. Actually, before that first, um, we read the 12 steps, and it says, uh, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives had become unmanageable. That's the first step. And that's what it says on a board. And that's what it says on page 59 in the big book. But on page 
or in the big book, it talks about until I fully conceded to my innermost self that I was alcoholic, nothing could be accomplished. And there's a big difference from conceding it to your innermost self to admitting that I have a problem. And in my heart of hearts, I knew. And my bottom was when I did step one. That was my absolute bottom because I realized I had this fatal and progressive illness, you know. And uh, he sold me on an idea, and it was a crazy idea. He said, maybe there's a God out there that could solve your problem. And uh, I was agnostic mostly at the time, somewhat a little bit of an atheist. I had no need or no want for God. You know, my parents were taken from me at a very young age, and I thought there was a God. He's a pretty cruel one. So I just kind of abandoned the whole idea, and he said, well, you got to believe in something. And I said, well, I don't. You know, and he said, well, you know what the beautiful thing is? You don't have to believe in a God to do it. You don't have to believe in a power greater than yourself to do the steps. And we went through the second step, and I'm arguing with him through the whole uh, We Agnostics chapter, and I'm like, God this, and God that, and blah, blah, blah. And, and finally he looks at me and says, Jerry! And I said, what? He said, you're mad at a God you don't believe in. I'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> and he sold me on this crazy idea that lack of power was my dilemma. That I lacked the power to control the amount of beer that I drank. And it talks about it in her book and it says lack of power was our dilemma. And it said what this book is about is about finding a power greater than ourselves. That's the main purpose of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not about drinking. It's, it's a misleading name, Alcoholics Anonymous. You think it'd be all about drinking. But it's not. It's all about God. And God being the ultimate higher power in my life. Now, I didn't understand it back then. And uh, today I have so much power in my life, I don't even know what to do with it. And I mean that. If you have a problem with God or you don't have a God of your liking, I would encourage you right now to borrow mine. He's been keeping me sober for a number of years. And I think he's pretty funny. If you don't believe me, just look around. You know, this is, if Alcoholics Anonymous, it better be fun. Because if it ain't, I ain't doing it. And, you know, the first thing that I thought was really funny is, like, this book was written by an out-of-work stock promoter and a butt doctor. <laughs> if you can't get down with that, then there's something really wrong. <laughs> and that's where I met God, was in, was, in the, was in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't meet him in church. I didn't meet him in the woods. I met him in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I had this idea... This question that I asked myself during the second step, and if you're suffering from alcoholism in here tonight, or you're new, or you're coming back, maybe it's a question you need to ask yourself. And what I asked myself in the second step was, what if this works? What happens if I go through with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and some miracle happens in my life? And that's all I had to base this on was, what if? And I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it one shot, and I'm going to put my everything into it. And he said, you're ready to do a third step. And I got on my knees, and I realized what the real problem was. It says, God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self. And I thought, what do you mean, relieve me of the bondage of self? You mean relieve me of the bondage of alcohol, right? And he said, no, because your real problem is selfishness and self-centeredness. See, I'm like a giant ingrown hair turned in on myself. I think I'm the only person in the place that matters. And I started to really, really hit home with this idea. And, it, and I didn't know if it was going to work. But I got on my knees and I said that third step prayer. And I voiced it without a reservation. And I held nothing back from it and I honestly meant it. And I hear people saying, oh, I took my will back. And I think you never really gave it over then. Because if you gave it to God, there's nothing to take back. It's God's. He'll hand it back to me with a clean slate. And I... And, you know, I, I work with a bunch of, uh, I work with chronic relapsers and newcomers. And uh, I've never relapsed myself, but there's the people that I seem to reach. And very often enough, I'll have them in a, in, in a, fourth, in a fourth step in the first day. We'll work the steps at eight days. We're going to do this very quickly because in how it works, it says, may you find God now. It doesn't say, may you find God three relapses from now. May you find God six months from now. May you find him now. And they talk about, being rocketed into a fourth dimension. And I'm trying to figure out what the fourth dimension was, and I came across this literature, and, and Bill Wilson talked about it. He said Albert Einstein actually came up with the idea of the fourth dimension. He said three dimensions is the world we live in, one being height, width, and length. 
That's the three dimensions. And the fourth being time. And it was a place where I'd never been in my entire life was present in my life. Because I always lived in the past, worried about the past catching up to me. You know, my sponsor said something really, really cool to me when I started writing a four-step. He said, Jerry, I want you to give up hope of a better past. (laughs) And I went, okay, I can do that. See, the place where I was rocketed to was right here and right now. Because the only time that I'd ever been present in my life was with a quart of whiskey. And that's the only time I'd ever get present in the here and the right now. And if I don't learn to get present with God right here, right now, I'll go back to which may be present. I'll go back to the drink. And we started a fourth step. And, you know, you see the steps on the wall. And if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps sound like punishment, welcome. Um, (laughs) That's how they sounded to me when I got here. And I can assure you, you're wrong, as I found out I was wrong. He asked me a question. He said, can you make a list of all the people that you hate? I went, absolutely, no problem. And he said, good, let's start there. And he said, all the people, place, and things that you have disagreements with or you dislike, we can do that. And I said, sure, no problem. He said, you have to have it done by tomorrow. And I said, okay. And I came back, and I had 163 resentments on this list. And I thought I wasn't that angry. Meanwhile, I had things on there like automated telephone service. Have you ever tried to call Revenue Canada and talk to a human being? <laughs> Drives me nuts. Still to this day, I resent that one. And then he said in the second column, he said, you know, and, and we did the bit, we, we did the four step out of the big book. I know there's some sheets that go around sometimes where you just fill in the blanks. Um, I would suggest trying it from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with somebody who's done it before. And there's some people grinning and shaking their heads right now. And if you find those people, then ask them how to do this. Because we'll show you how to do it out of the book. And it says, that it's only one line for the next column. It says, we asked ourselves why we were angry. And he said, can you write down those reasons why you're angry? And I said, absolutely, no problem. You know, I'm, I'm professional at taking other people's inventory. So what I did is I started writing down what these people had done to me. They'd stole from me. They lied to me. They gossiped about me. You know, they beat me up. They stole my money. They ripped me off. And, and, and I had, and ended up coming up with about 500 reasons why people hated me or why I hated these people. And the third step, I realized how that affected me, how it affected my self-esteem, my ambition, my personal relationships, my sexual relationships. And then he said, we're going to get to the fourth column. And I didn't like that one. I don't like it at all because now we're going to turn this around. See, in the fourth step, it says this is a fact-finding and fact-facing mission. And in the fourth step, the fourth column is called the fact-facing. It's when you start to face these things. And, and, I, and I came to realize that I play a part in every single one of these. Actually, that's a lie. Because if I only play a part, it's saying that they still play a part. And it says I'm to disregard the other person involved entirely and see where my own faults and mistakes were. And by this time in the step group, there was only two of us left. Five people had already dropped out, and it was me and a a friend of mine, Kevin. And I remember watching Kevin change, and he was really freaking me out because he was starting to change during this fourth step. And one day I'm walking by his room, and he says, Jerry, come in here for a second. So I said, come in. He says, shut the door for a second. So I shut the door, and he says, have a seat. And I sit down. He goes, listen, man, i got to just tell you something. I'm just going to tell you straight. He goes, you're really changing, man. It's freaking me out. <laughs> I was like, dude, same thing. See, so often we can see the change in other people before they see it in themselves. And through the fourth step, I finally got unvictimized. And I took my life into my own hands. And I realized that I'm the, I'm the catalyst in all these things. I set the ball rolling. And then we got into the fears list. And I thought, you know what? I'm not afraid of anything. You know, I have no fears. And then In the third step, it says, selfishness and self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, self-pity, we step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate, seemingly without provocation. But we variably find in every case that we made a decision based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. And I remember saying, okay, I'm going to do my fear calling. And what I did is I worked the step backwards, what I was afraid of. And most of the time, I was afraid of what the cause was. And I came up with 96 different fears. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm in real trouble here. And then it says we ask God to remove our fears, and they start to happen at once. They start to fall away. Today I can tell you the only fear I really have is finding a book by Bill Wilson called Just Kidding. (laughs) 
And after that, God, I started to feel some real cool things happen in my life. And I had to do a sexual inventory. And I thought, what, just a list, a list of people that I banged before? And he says, no, 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 it's not like that. He says, the list of the conducts that you had done over the years. And I thought, well, that's, that's not going to be that hard because really what it looked like. And, and doing a sexual inventory, I realized that I was really quite lucky to be having sex period at all. <laughs> and it says, we asked ourselves this one question, was it selfish or not? And 99.5% of the time it was selfish. You know, I never cared about my partners. And it really, really hit home about how, how you know, some people in, in my neck of the woods say this is a selfish program. And I strongly disagree with that. Because my book says selfishness will kill me. I must be rid of selfishness or it will kill me. This is a selfless program. And what happened was is through, these, through this inventory work, and inventory work is nothing more than a bunch of lists, prayers, and observations. And it was the prayers and observations that really started to change my life. It wasn't so much the writing of it. It was the observation of I can see this happening in my life now. And he started to prep me for a fifth step. And I really didn't want to do a fifth step. I really, really, really didn't want to do a fifth step. And he said, do you want to stay sober? And I said, yes. And he said, then you need to do a fifth step and you need to be absolutely honest. And I said, okay, I'll do a fifth step. And he set me up with a stranger, a guy I'd never met before. And I remember I was standing at the, at the back gate of my treatment center and I had my fourth step and my big book and my knees are just knocking. I'm shaking because I've got some dirty secrets. I've got some things that nobody should know. Because if anybody knows the things that I've done, they'll ask me to leave. Because that's what people, normal people do. And you look like normal people to me. You'd ask me to leave. And I got in, and this guy shows up, and I see him pull up, and he says he's in a Jeep, and he pulls us up, and the music's cranked, and he gets out, and he kind of saunters across the parking lot, and I'm like, this guy's stoned, man. <laughs> you know, you can just tell when somebody's stoned, his eyes were all glazed over, and he was smiling, and he was just sort of sauntering. And I thought, I can't do a fifth step with this guy. And I thought, wait a minute, he probably won't remember anything I say anyway. <laughs> um, turns out he wasn't stoned, that was serenity, I'd just never seen it before. <laughs> And he took me to this park on the downtown east side and in about two and a half hours I spilt my guts and I told him every little thing that I'd ever done and I told him from the point of view of a defective character you know I married a, I married a woman because she had money and because I was greedy I didn't really love her and that's the point of view that I took it from it wasn't so much of what I had done wrong but the point of view of the defective character that I came from because it says we admitted to our faults to another person, but in the fourth step of the book it says we admitted our defects to another person. And that's when I started to realize what my defects were. They were my motives. And after this two and a half hour session with this guy, we got up and we started to walk across the field to where his Jeep was. And I felt terrible. I felt the worst I'd ever felt in my entire life. I felt I'm the biggest piece of garbage in the entire world. And this guy must just think I'm an absolute animal. And I looked over at him and he looked down at me and he winked. And he said, way to go, kid, you just did it. And all of a sudden the colors got a little bit brighter. And my step got a little bit lighter. And there's some important instructions at a fifth step. Afterwards, you're going to go spend an hour by yourself with this, with this power of God. And what happened was I went into my room. And I can only describe to you how it happened to me. It was I fell on my knees and I started to weep. And that's different than crying. And the next thing that happened was love exploded in my heart. And I had the sensation that somebody was pouring warm water over me. And it felt like it was flowing through my entire body. And something physically came down and put its arms around me. And I heard a voice and it said, everything's going to be okay. And I remember I came out of that fifth step and I opened my door and my sponsor was standing there. He said, what's going on, Jerry? I looked at him. I said, I don't think I'm ever going to drink again. And he said that probably the most important thing that anybody had ever said to me up until this point in Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, I know I believe you. He said, you just had a spiritual experience. And if you want, I can show you how to have another one. And I said, absolutely. I love this feeling. I love this feeling. I want to feel this for the rest of my life. And he said, they only get bigger and they only get better. And I thought, this is something I can really sink my teeth into. And he said, now we got to finish. That's what steps 6 through 12 are about. About how to reproduce this feeling in others. Not just in yourself, but in others. 
And in the sixth step, I became willing to have these defects removed. And I spotted my deep, and, and the fourth step is really only there for two purposes. One, to, to identify the defect of character, and two, to identify the people that I'd harmed. That's the real reasons for doing a fourth step. And through this, I realized that I was greedy, that I was envious, that I was lustful, that I was prideful, that I was ego-driven. And all these, and what they were, were motives. My motives were mixed up, and, and it was always about what can I get. And it was never about giving back to the other person. So in the sixth step, I become willing to have God remove these. And it says, if I still cling to something, I ask until it be gone, and until the willingness be given to me. So some mornings I wake up, and I don't really want to get rid of lust. You know, in Bill's story, he says, he asked his, he asked his maker to take his, his uh, sins root and branch. See, sometimes I want the branch gone because it's poking me in the eye, but I don't really want to get rid of the defective character. Like, if I get rid of lust, does that mean that I'm not going to look at women ever again? You know, if, if this is, is this going to turn me into Ned Flanders? Am I going to become a religious bore? You know, I've, I've seen people who, who fell in love with Jesus and ended up selling daisies at the airport. I didn't want that to be me. <laughs> and God had something better in store for me. So I said, yeah, I'm willing. And the sixth and seventh step are probably the most misunderstood steps in Alcoholics Anonymous. And they're not something that you do once. They're something that you do up to 50 to 100 times a day. See, I remember standing out in front of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm hearing this guy work with this newcomer, and he's filling his head full of, well, slogans. And he's telling this guy, it's all going to be all right. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, he's going to kill this guy. And I say, should I say something? See, and I would say something to him with three different motives. One motive would be to prove this guy wrong. The second would prove how right I was. Or third would be to help him. And I had to shut up. Because my motive was not to help. My motive was to make this guy look bad. And I wouldn't have changed a word of what I said. But the motive was, was wrong. And in the seventh step it says, My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character which stands in my way of usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. And that's the second half of the third step prayer. If you notice at the third step prayer, they don't say amen. The third and seventh step prayer are meant to be combined together. And it says, this is only my opinion, but uh, seeing as I'm the one with the microphone, you're all entitled to it. <laughs> it says we ask God to remove our defects of character, good and bad. See, I don't know which ones are good or which ones are bad, so I give them all to God. And he'll decide which ones to take. Sometimes my de defects are delightful, I guess. And that's why I get to keep them. <laughs> when I first got sober, I was a real AA Nazi, and I used to come from the podium, and you need to do this, and you need to do that, and blah, 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 and come off like fire and brimstone. And it worked for a lot of people. I got to help a lot of people that way. But as I got closer to God, God seemed to speak a little quieter to me. You know, he, he was a little more gentle with me. And he says, if you really want to help people, Work from love and inspiration. Come from a place of love and try to inspire people. And the seventh step is a decision that I make every day. And the decision is, am I willing to get up and live for the good of God and others? Or am I willing to get up and live for myself? And I used to have a little card that I put beside my bed, and that's what it said. It said, are you willing to live for yourself or God? And if it was for myself, I was supposed to go back to sleep and wake up until, until it said that I'm willing to live for the good of others. See, my very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on the constant thought of others and how I may help meet their needs. And that's what my life is devoted to. In my home group, I get, sometimes I was, or I've been accused of hoarding newcomers. And I said, that's okay, because when I hear somebody raise their hand, they say there's a newcomer, a little song plays in my mind. It goes, dun, 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 dun. And I become like a shark in the water. And I want to find this guy, because I want to make sure that he has the same opportunity that was given to me. I want to make sure that the message of Alcoholics Anonymous was clear and concise out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, what happened with the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, how it came to be, was these guys were getting sober in Akron and, and in New York, and, and you all know the, the background history. And what was happening is people were carrying the message to other people. But it's kind of like if you play that little game where, say, you go whisper in somebody's ear and you say, I went to a Yankees game and had a hot dog. And then it goes around the room, and by the time it gets to the end of the room, you've killed a Yankee and had sex with three weeder dogs or some stupid shit. <laughs> and the story changed. It wasn't quite the same as what it was, so they decided to write a book so that we can have a clear and concise message that will never change. You know, sometimes I hear some watered-down messages in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think, this is going to kill us. This will kill us. 
And then I think, you know what, I know some people, my friend Adrian over there, he's willing to stand by the door with the big book. And I'm sure there's other people in here who are willing to stand by the door of the big book. And because you're willing to do that, I know that Alcoholics Anonymous will never die. Because there's people willing to do that. Wow, I just had this weird thought. Imagine if we were all drinking right now. <laughs> Manage the damage we could do to this place. <laughs> but on the other hand, imagine if we were all carrying the same message. Imagine if we're all telling newcomers that as a result of working the steps, we had spiritual experiences and the obsession to drink left and the selfishness left and all we want to do is help others. Imagine a shot that newcomer would have when he comes in here instead of hearing fake it till you make it or go to 90 meetings in 90 days. Somebody was willing to take the time to him. And it's something that in Bill's story he talks about when Ebby came to see him. He said, my friend sat and talked with me for hours. Are we willing to do that with newcomers nowadays? Are we willing to sit with them for hours? Because I know in my part of the town, a lot of people say, well, there's a step group starting, why don't you join him or call this person, and they want to brush you off. See, my job is, when I work at 12 Step, is to find out everything I can about you, and I want you talking. I want to find out where you're at. Some people say, the, you know, you can always tell when a newcomer's lying, his lips are moving. And I thought, how insulting is that? Because this is the person that's going to save my life because I'm going to work with him. I need to know everything about him. I need to know his religious learnings. I need to know his, his drinking habits. And because I want, to, I want to be able to turn the table in case it was me that was being approached, how would I like to be approached? I'd want to be approached with loving kindness and compassion. And that's what we try to do. But I couldn't do that yet. I wasn't able to carry the message because I still had a lot of unwritten work to do. And in the eighth step... All I had to do was become willing to make amends to these people. So I took a list, of pa I took a paper, and I made a list, willing and unwilling. And I wrote everybody's name down on there, whether I was willing to make an amends to you or whether I was unwilling to make amends to you. And the people that I was making, that I was willing to make amends to, I started doing them right away. In my first year of sobriety, I made 76 personal amends. I traveled, I wrote post-dated checks, I did work for them. You know, and there was a, there's a, there's a, a real clear cut way in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous on how to make amends. It's, and, and, it, and it tells us why we make amends. It says, it, the making an amends isn't for me and it isn't for them. It says, my real purpose is to fit myself to be a maximum service to God and the people about me. That's why I make amends. So what I do with these people is I approach them and I say, you know what? I regret the fact that our friendship was harmed because I did this. And then I ask them, I say, is there anything else that I've done? I don't know if I've done anything else to harm you, but if there is, I'd like to know. And I would like to know how to make it right. See, I don't tell them what I'm going to do. I ask them what I should do in order to make it right. And then I do the hardest thing that's in the world for me to do is I shut up. And I listen to them. And then I do what they ask. One of the coolest things about making financial amends is nobody, nobody want, nobody says, no, no, you don't owe me the money. They all want their money back. <laughs> and I remember about two years ago, I'd saved up about $1,000 to buy a new TV. And all of a sudden, Money Mart got my number. And about five years before, I'd written a payday loan, and I hadn't paid it back yet. And they started calling me three, four times a day. And I was getting really, really aggravated. And I seen my grand sponsor one day, and I said, you know, these guys are harassing me. They're literally harassing me. I'm going to call the police. He says, Jerry, you can't do that. And I said, why? He says, they don't want your money. They want their money. <laughs> so I still have the same TVs I did two years ago because I went and paid the debt. <laughs> you know, when making amends, I got to experience the promises, the nine-step promises, freedom and happiness, intuitive thought, peace, serenity. You know, financial insecurities will leave suddenly realized that God had been doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And it launched me into a new language, and it's about the 10th step. See, a lot of people say steps 10, 11, and 12 are the maintenance steps. And maintenance is what you do on your car. See, in the 10th step, it said our next function was to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And that's my purpose of, of what I want to do here in Alcoholics Anonymous, is grow with God, my understanding of alcoholism, and, and how effective I can be of working with others. In the four years I've been sober, I've worked with over 500 alcoholics through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, um, and that's because God allows me to. But it all hasn't been roses either, because at two years sober, I was, I was in my home and uh, I was writing some inventory and I looked down and I'd written a suicide note. 
and I don't remember writing it. And I started to think about suicide in my life. And, and I'm working with all these people, and I don't understand what's going on. I finally tell my roommate, and he says, well, we need to go get you checked out. So they took me to the hospital where they have doctors that God has abundantly given us. And I, and I told them what the problem was and what was going on in my life. And they said, well, it sounds to me like you have severe depression. Would you like to come into the hospital with us? Because if not, we're going to commit you anyway. And I said, well, I'll go voluntarily. And they held me there for three and a half months. And in that time, I got to take a gentleman through the steps who is still sober to this day while I was in there. But what happened was I ended up going through 23 rounds of electroshock therapy. And while I was in the hospital, every day somebody from Alcoholics Anonymous came to see me. Every day. See, you can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. And you showed up. And it meant the world to me. Because I never had to do this thing alone. I never had to cry alone. You know, there's always been somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous that's willing to walk with me. And I've been, and because of that, I'm willing to walk with them. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference of what God's work is and what the bad guy's work is. Because if you think about it, God and the devil both sell the bling bling, the flashing neon lights. Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be fantastic. And there's only one way you can tell the difference between God and the devil. God attaches a price. He says, it's going to cost you your time. It may cost you money. It's going to cost you sleep. It's going to cost you all these other things. They may burn or smash a TV in your room or burn a mattress in your home. These are the prices that I'm going to have to pay in order to have this wonderful life. The tenth step, I experience the promises of the tenth step, which are more intense than the ninth step promises for me. It says I would be safe and protected, placed in a position of neutrality. See, the problem has been removed. And the problem wasn't alcohol. The problem was selfishness and self-centeredness that had been removed. And I started to do the impossible thing that I could never do before. And I was started to think about other people. And the more people that I've come to work with, the better I am. And it took me into 11th step. And it's the first time I ever did, did the, the uh, prayer and meditation. For my first six months, I did not work with prayer and meditation. I worked with little prayers, God, thanks, help, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I remember going to see this work, this workshop on this lady doing this 11-step speaker meeting. And uh, she inspired me, boy. And I went home and I went, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to pray and I'm going to meditate. And I went home and I turned off the TV and I turned off the radio and I turned on the lights and lit a couple of candles and whew, took a big breath. And all of a sudden I was like, what are you going to think about? 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 It was like, ah! Turn the TV back on because when, when it got quiet out there, boy, it got noisy in here. And I remember about two weeks ago, I was walking downtown and uh, a squirrel was crossing the street and all of a sudden he stopped and he looked up at me and I looked down and I said, it's funny to see you outside my head for a change. <laughs> Today, my daily practice is I sit twice a day for 26 minutes in silence. I do it first thing in the morning, I do it before I go to bed. And that started at one minute a day, twice a day, because that's all I could do. And over the past few years, I've been able to gradually get more time. And not all the times I'm inspired, as it says. And it says, sometimes we may pay for this with absurd actions and behaviors. And I thought, all right, it lets me know that I'm human. I can screw this thing up. You know, I can make mistakes, and it's going to be okay. Because all the time that I hear things, and, you know, sometimes, well, that's obviously God. And it's like, well, probably not. It's probably you. You know, and, and, I've, and I've come to realize that my good ideas, I need to bounce off somebody else. So I, too, have a sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous who I say, you know what? I was thinking about doing this and this and this. And he says, wait a minute. Didn't you already do that? And it didn't work? And I went, well, yeah, but this time it'll be different, right? <laughs> and it rocketed me to a new place. And I remember I was sitting at home about two years ago. And... uh I said a little prayer. I always pray the same thing. I ask for inspiration. I ask to be inspired. I ask to be enthusiastic about Alcoholics Anonymous. I ask to have somebody placed in my path. And then I asked God for the first time. I said, God, how can I get to know you better? And a voice came to me. and said, if you want to get to know me, get to know my children. And that's you people. And the more of you have come to meet, the better I know God. So after I'm done this tonight, please come shake my hand. I need to know God better. And it took me to the 12th step, which is what this whole deal is about. You know, people say, do the work in Alcoholics Anonymous. Do the work, do the work. And I always say, do the steps first. Because the work begins at the 12th step. 
is when we go out and carry this message. See, my book asked me to be an intelligent agent, a spearhead of his ever-advancing creation. And I try to carry this message of power and freedom from the bondage of self to others, to my co-workers, to my family, and especially to the alcoholic who still suffers. And what's happened in Vancouver is we've started this little movement, and they call it Big Book Boot Camp. And uh, myself and my sponsor started it about three and a half years ago where we take people through the steps in eight days, and we get them excited about God. Because of what we really are here is really celebrating the power of God. You know, a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous should be nothing more than a pep rally for God. And sometimes we talk about all kinds of stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous and we never get down to the brass tacks of what this is about. And I sponsor a number of guys and girls. Because my book says we're a fellowship of men and women who share experience, strength, and hope with each other doesn't say that I, because there's a lot of women that I've had to sponsor because, well, there's not a long, strong women sponsor. So for you women out there who are, who are sponsoring, thank you. We need more of you. They're dying in the trenches out there. They're, they're, they're coming in and they're burnt out and they don't know how to get well. And we need strong women in our fellowship. And that's what's starting to happen in this, in Vancouver at least. I don't know what it's like out here, but I hope it's the same way that, the, that women are being sponsored correctly and taken through the steps. And, uh, well, it's just about that time. I'm going to close with a little story that I heard when I was about three months sober. And it really carried me a long way. And it was a story about an alcoholic in a hole. And he's screaming and he's yelling and he's screaming and he's yelling for help. And a businessman hears him. And the businessman walks over to the edge of the hole. He looks down and he goes, what's the problem? And the guy says, I'm alcoholic and I can't get out of this hole. And the businessman says, oh, that's too bad. Here's some money. Buy yourself a ladder. And he leaves. But the alcoholic's still stuck there. And he's screaming and he's yelling and he's screaming and he's yelling. And a priest hears him. And the priest comes over and he says, what's the problem? He says, I'm an alcoholic and I can't get out of this hole. He says, oh, that's too bad, son. When you get out, come to church. I'll pray for you. And he leaves him. And he's screaming and he's yelling and he's screaming and he's yelling. And a psychiatrist hears him. And the psychiatrist walks over and he says, what's the problem? The guy says, I'm an alcoholic and I can't get out of this hole. And the psychiatrist says, were you born in that hole? And the guy says, no. And he says, did your parents put you in that hole? And he says, no. And he says, oh, I see my time's up here. I'll be back next week, same time to talk with you. <laughs> and a recovered alcoholic hears him. He hears the screaming and yelling. And the recovered alcoholic walks over to the hole and he looks down and he goes, what's the problem? And the guy says, I'm alcoholic and I can't get out of this hole. And the guy jumps in the hole with him and goes, I'm alcoholic too. And the first guy looks at him and goes, you idiot, we're both stuck here. And the recovered alcoholic says, no, I've been here before. I know the way out. Thank you. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.